Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I wanted to make a video about the uh, week eight materials and the surveillance state. Uh, one of the things you might have noticed, especially if you look at dates of videos, uh, video uploads and things like that, is that most of the material in this course was assembled earlier this year for the winter quarter at Drexel. Uh, I noticed, you know, it's just rewatching the video that I made for last week. I noticed it was made in, in February. And, uh, you know, it's just something that you do when you're teaching online, or you're teaching courses, you will, you know, you'll reuse material. And if you think you did a good job in, say, a video or something, there's really no reason to re-record it unless the situation has changed or you want to take a different approach. So, um, But I'm making this, this video in uh, September 2020, and boy, February 2020 seems like a long time ago. <laughs> a long time ago. Uh, and you know exactly what I mean by that. And it struck me looking over the, you know, re-looking re, re at the materials for this week um, that, um, well, what are we looking at here? We're looking at what is essentially a, a Chinese phenomenon. That is the, the use of digital technology for surveillance. And here we're, we're really focusing on government surveillance and uh, is is a, a global thing. There's no question about it. I mean, almost every country in the world, to some degree, is the, the, the government is using digital technology to surveil its population. Uh, at least, <clears throat> you know, England, uh, UK has been a leader in, in this for a long time. You'll, you'll, if you listen to British people talk about CCTV, uh, first I didn't know what they were talking about, and then the idea of cameras in the streets uh, as a way, uh, as a law enforcement technique uh, has been around for a long time. But what we're looking at now is the, is the Chinese phenomenon, because there's really nothing like it in the world where you have an advanced economy, which the Chinese certainly are now. Uh, you have a high degree of um, technical sophistication on the part of uh, people there in terms of their, their their skills and understanding of computers, digital technology, really a world leader now, China in that. And you have a repressive uh, dictatorial regime, which is certainly what China is. I mean, I don't mean, if you're Chinese, I don't mean to, to you know, put you down or put your country down, but it's, it's, it, it's a totalitarian state. It's not the only one, but it's the biggest, most powerful one. Um, so when we combine the power of digital technology with surveillance, and then we combine that with a country like China, where the government is, uh, you know, you have a one party, uh, basically a party dictatorship, the Chinese Communist Party runs the country, there's no question about it. Um, when you combine those three things, uh, an authoritarian government, uh, a um, you know, surveillance and digital technology, you come up with a huge this huge thing that the Chinese are creating, which is basically a, a digital surveillance state. Uh, it's something we should all be aware of. Uh, and I'm not saying that we should, uh, again, I'm not, I'm not being anti-Chinese, I hope. I really, really hope that. Um, but, you know, if you criticize Trump for his ridiculousness and racism and being sexual predator and being incompetent, what all the reasons I would attack Donald Trump, you're not attacking America. You're attacking this, the, the government or, or the, the president. And I think that, that that's perfectly legitimate. Uh, you know, so I'm not, I hope I'm, I, I'm not coming off as being anti-Chinese. I, I, I don't think I am. I think I'm just being frank about what I believe to be the facts about it. So, there's a very interesting and troubling thing going on in China, and uh, the you know it, it presents us with a certain interesting situation. The reason I mentioned that all that's happened between February and today is that the kind of violation of, of rights, uh, the kind of dangers to civil liberties and freedoms that the surveillance state in China poses. Um, one would imagine that the counterpoise to that, the resistance to that globally, would be the United States. Uh, but under Donald Trump, 
And especially since the start of the COVID pandemic, the standing of the United States in terms of its moral standing, its defending of human rights is has plummeted. We, we simply don't in the United States represent, I think, what we used to, arguably used to, and that is a, a defense against these infringements of freedom. Um, it's just not, the United States doesn't mean that anymore globally. It's, it, we're finding out what the United States will mean in the future globally, day by day, as this thing, especially this pan- pandemic, pans out. And, you know, our standing in, in, in terms of other countries wanting to be like the United States is kind of at a low point because we've so disastrously handled the COVID-19 crisis. Um, nobody wants to be in the United States right now. I mean, because it's it's too dangerous. Uh, because we've, you know, we, we've got people dying in huge numbers. We're approaching them. Um, 200,000 uh, deaths, and certainly by the end of this class, we'll be above that, and probably already are above that. So what I'm saying is that the, the Chinese model is really running kind of unresisted right now. And, and, and so uh, it's definitely something to think about, and it's definitely something to say, well, this is the future. This is a future. This, this, this issue will not go away, and it's not really clear if you are really troubled by the kind of state surveillance that the Chinese have put together as a model for other countries to follow, it's a, it's a, going to be a continuing issue in your life, probably for the rest of your lives. Um, it's a very, very complicated issue. And uh, I like the way that this Time Magazine article uh, starts with an old lady losing her, her pocketbook, her bag, you know, and, and it being recovered because everything was caught on camera. Somebody saw that it was on the street on a camera and put it in a lost and found it. She found it. And she's like, I like the cameras. They're, they keep me safe. And, you know, that is not an atypical response to state authoritarianism. Uh, I was shocked and appalled, for instance, when uh, the dictator uh, Duterte in the Philippines took over, who was clearly a human rights abuser, I mean, a war criminal, and should be, you know, in jail. There's no question about it. But he's he's pretty popular in the Philippines. And one of the reasons he's popular in the Philippines is because uh, his tactics of just, say, murdering criminals or murdering drug drug addicts and murdering drug dealers has been effective in some people's minds in raising the quality of their lives. People who live under very sort of desperate conditions in the Philippines. Um, you know, that's the thing about authoritarianism people actually do love it. I mean, that's what you got to understand. I mean, at least a portion of the population will be all for it because they, they see nothing but benefits. The way that I'm sure lots of Germans during the Nazi period saw nothing but benefits uh, by the Nazis uh, coming into power. You know, things, practical benefits, uh, you know, stability, uh, less uh, fighting in the streets. Uh, there's no more horrible inflation. You know, I've got a job. So wh- why should I worry about, you know, the fact that all of the Jewish people have disappeared or uh, the communists are, have all been killed or uh, people are being, you know, or our country is invading. I mean, you know, people have this amazing ability to put those things out of their minds, you know, as long as their, their lives are, are okay. So I like that, the way this begins, but, but then, you know, the description of how life has changed in China as a result of the deployment of cameras, the use of facial recognition uh, is really, really frightening. And it becomes much more, it becomes very complicated because, of course, if you listen to these really great podcasts on the surveillance state, they're really about one issue. They're not just about the general use of digital technology to surveil in China. They're about a particular issue, and that is um, an ethnic repression. The use in, a, in a, a province of China, which is traditionally a Muslim uh, province with a, an ethnic minority called the Uyghurs. And there has been unrest. You know, there's definitely been ethnic tension there. And the Chinese are handling it the way that authoritarian governments typically handle what they see as troublesome minorities, troublesome ethnic groups. Uh, That is, they repress them. They they, they flood the the area with uh, people of other ethnicities to kind of water down the population. And they uh, take active measures to 
to suppress any kind of dissent. Uh, opening of re-education camps, um, you know, jailing people for political offenses, but a new uh, use of uh, surveillance to do that. That is, if you are a Uyghur living in Xinjiang, I hope I'm getting that right, the province, uh, you can pretty much expect, but, but at least if you live in a major city, uh, to be surveilled constantly uh, by the authorities and in ways that were simply not possible in earlier uh, situations of that kind of uh, repression. And just read the details, you know, the, the way that uh, cameras are everywhere, the way that, um, you know, once you're in a database in terms of your physical appearance, even your DNA, I think, um, your voice patterns and things like that, the ability to track you and to observe you is simply, uh, it's total, you know, so that people don't even need to be actively threatened in order to stop complaining or conform. They just know that they're constantly being watched and that any sort of what is regarded as deviant behavior will be punished. Uh, it is a dystopia. It's a nightmare for, for those people. And it's a huge human rights. It's probably the largest human rights uh, uh, abuse going on in the in the world today, the, the Rohingya in, in, in uh, Myanmar and Burma and, and, and the Uyghurs in China being probably the most oppressed um, ethnic group in the world right now. Uh, well, of course, you're in our own country, I'm not, I'm not letting the United States off the hook. Believe me, I, I'm aware of uh, ethnic and other forms of discrimination, oppression, which can take lethal forms, obviously, in the United States. But uh, this is, a, I would say, a, a, a different sort of situation. Uh, imagine if the U.S. government, for instance, put every black community in America under this type of surveillance as a response to uh, the kind of unrest and protests we had earlier this year. That would be equivalent to what's happening, I think, in, in China and black people in America disappearing, going to re-education camps, uh, being forced to give over their biometric uh, data and things like that. I mean, it would be horrible, horrible, horrible and shocking and disgusting. And that is what is happening in China. And, you know, I don't mean to make this class about a human rights, you know, standing up for human rights, but it's really about the way that digital technology has raised new ethical issues. And really what the reason I've given it to you is just the tremendous deployment, the tremendous innovation and changes and advance uh, in surveillance of populations, which is only made possible by uh, digital technology. This would have never been able to be done at this level with this kind of intensity and this kind of scope before uh, digital technology made information processing at this at this uh, level actually possible. And it is, I think, a typical Hans Jonas uh, situation where we have gone beyond uh, what we're used to. You know, we've gone beyond uh, the, the kind of limits and uh, the kind of finite powers of technology that we were used to and, and could kind of negotiate. And we're in an entirely different world, so it's not really clear how to deal with it or even how to ethically evaluate it. You know, I mean, that's one of the things, reasons I brought up America's diminished stature in the world, because I think we're moving into a world in which the typical Western liberal uh, defense of human rights over state power, of uh, freedom over security and safety, of uh, freedom of speech over the need for unity, things like that, given the failures of the United States and other Western countries like the UK, who've failed uh, too, but not in a spectacular way as the United States, has really um, diminished the global uh, appetite for uh, liberalism and human rights. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you're living in a country where very few people have died of COVID, and then you look at the United States where hundreds of thousands have died and probably hundreds of thousands more will die. 
the United States does not look like the model of the kind of country you want to, you want to live in. You want to live in a country where there's like, you know, 3,000 deaths, not 300,000 deaths. Um, so the United States right now looks chaotic, dangerous, uh, uncertain, and countries like China and other authoritarianisms look, you know, like things are going okay. So what I'm saying is, you know, it, it's, <laughs> you know, it's a very, it, it's a very new situation. And it's the, the kind of thing where um, the kind of huge deployment of uh, surveillance on the part of the government uh, may look to a lot of people like a good idea. You know? So, I mean, I think it's an incredibly interesting issue. I don't mean to put my politics on you in, in any way. You're free to disagree with me. Um, but it is, uh, I think, for us, for us who are trying to grasp, you know, as people in college and pursuing an education, trying to grasp a more sophisticated understanding of the world, this is a huge, a huge issue.